Hello and welcome to Ullapool. Well, sadly, not Ullapool, but my house. Um, I'm going to guess that, like you and uh, uh, me and everybody else, we've been looking forward to over the last year, focusing throughout this pandemic, this terrible pandemic year on the second weekend of May, and that pivotal time for all of us, the uh, Ullapool Book Festival. And uh, sadly, both last year and this year, uh, that hasn't happened, and that's why I'm not there. I have to say, as this uh, welcome address from the honorary president of the uh, Oracle Book Festival, I have to say my honorary presidency has, uh, must be the most troubled and troublesome in the entire UBF history. However, I think that even given uh, the fact that uh, we can't be together this year in Oracle, doesn't mean to say that we're not going to have a fantastic uh, celebration of books and reading and a great Ullapool book festival. I mean, in a sense, writers and readers weren't really supposed to be together. I mean, uh, it's all about it. what's so fascinating that we can, we can read people from many, many miles away and many, many uh, centuries apart and still feel the connection. Uh, right now, I'm working on a text uh, in satire of the three estates written 470 years ago and yet I feel this connection with David Lindsay. But in all of all, we do love being together. We do love uh, walking around uh, the streets of Ullapool and going down to the Cayley Place and, uh, and of course the scones and, and chatting about who we've listened to and what we've heard. And in a sense, I think that can keep on going. Uh, and in one sense, uh, better even than usual. This is going to be another great Ullapool Book Festival. Joan and the team have gone out their way to make it as Ullapool as possible. And it's as rich and as deep and as varied as it always is. There's, there's Gaelic poetry, there's music, there's poetry from Ayrshire, there's crime from today, the here and now, and from the Victorian era. Um, there's travel writing, there's political writing, uh, there's history. All those conversations that we have every year in Ullapool about who we are, where we've been and where we're going. And this year, although we don't have that one special weekend in the second uh, weekend of May, we are going to be together every Wednesday night, right through spring, right through summer into August. So in one sense, that's really, really special. And I'm kind of so looking forward to all that. And this is quite a special spring and summer hopefully at the end of which the world will look in a more recognisable shape and we can look forward to 2022. Welcome to Ullapool and to another session from this year's Ullapool Book Festival online. My name is Mark Ringe and joining me here in the Cayley Place to my great pleasure, uh, I have a household of poets. Um, two poets and three names. Uh, Miriam Gamble is from Belfast. Um, Patrick Mackay, or in English Peter Mackay, is from the Isle of Lewis. And they live in Edinburgh. At every stage of Miriam's poetic career, she has won awards. Um, two of them from the Society of Authors, and the most recent collection from which she will be reading today, What Planet, uh, has uh, last year won Ireland's most generous poetry prize, awarded at, I think, what is probably Ireland's best known book festival, the Stowe uh, Writers' Week. Um, She's also being uh, applauded for her first two collections, um, The Squirrels Are Dead, um, which is another intriguing title, I have to say, and Pirate Music. Uh, as I said, today she'll be reading from What Planet, uh, which uh, won the Pickett Poetry Prize uh, last year. Miriam lectures in creative writing at Edinburgh University. Uh, Peter Mackay is also an academic poet, and uh, also a broadcast uh, journalist, uh, has worked with the BBC uh, in Gaelic in particularly. Um, 
He was joint editor of Sue Little and Hool, uh, a collection of essays looking at the international influences on Gaelic writing. Uh, together with Joe MacDonald, published last year, he edited um, 100 Favourite Gaelic Poems, Kiyatta and Charlene. He's worked at the Seamus Heaney Centre. Um, he lectures in literature in St Andrews University and has, with Ian McPherson, edited An Lear Lea, uh, the Blue Book, I think you would translate that as, which is a historical collection of ribald and transgressive Gaelic literature. Um, I think that's fair to describe it as, yeah. Uh, his first collection, Galliard, was published in 2015, and today he's reading from his second collection, uh, again published um, last year, and that is Na uh, which we'll be hearing from very shortly. Um, thanks for joining us, and thanks for being here in Aldo uh, with us. Uh, a treat for us. Unfortunately, audiences will have to wait till next year to, to be able to enjoy that treat again. Just before you go into a reading, can we talk about the titles of the books? Because both, I think, are really engaging, thought-provoking titles. Um, I know for me, what planet makes you think, what phrase does that come from? Is it going to be, what planet are we on with these poems? <laughs> or is it... <laughs> Uh, something about the future of the planet or whatever. And as you read, you'll find out it's probably neither of those. <laughs> Na Dutte is, I think, unusual with titles for for uh, Gaelic collections in daring to have an ellipsis in it uh, and leaving it to you, the readers, to work out what follows Na Dutte. And of course, that does occur in two titles within the collection as well. So, um, yeah, tell us something about the titles to begin with. The book had a um, working title that is quite different, and I'm not going to share it because at some point down the line, I will hope to use that as a title <laughs> of the book. Um, and I had a poem that the, it was the title of, but the poem wasn't any good. And so I had to take the poem out of the, the collection. To be honest, there's two, two ways of looking at it. One, I went through the book and saw what was the phrase that appeared most commonly, and weirdly it was mattered there. So there was obviously something going on with my writing or my process that was provisional, that was trying to define in vague ways what I was wanting to look at, so that the fear for some kind of marvel or some kind of wonder. And I think that's one of the interesting things for me about poetry is this exploration of something you don't quite fully understand at the beginning or at the end of the process. Which is very apt um, for this collection of poems, I think, yeah. because they pay revisiting and revisiting as they reveal more uh, on every revisit. Yeah. I, I fail to appreciate that not everybody will understand a, 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 a kind of uh, or something like that. Miriam, what about um, what planet? Yeah, I mean, I think similarly, that was a, t a title that came quite late in the day. So this had a um, a working title of In the Anum, which is mm. one of the poems that's in it. But, um, and I'm, a, I'm really fond of that poem, uh, but I kind of, I did have a kind of consciousness that maybe it wasn't a title that covered everything <laughs> that's, um, I mean, it's a quite specifically situated poem it's set in Belfast in the kind of early 1990s. And it, um, spoke to an element of the work that's in the book, but maybe not to everything. And uh, the poem that the title comes from was written quite late in the process. Um, and yeah, it just presented itself as, um, and it's in, a, it's in a little spoken phrase that's in the voice of my mother, what planet is he living on? But he can think there's nothing wrong with her. So it's a, it's a poem about my grandmother and about lots of different perspectives um, or ex lots of different people experiencing the same thing in different ways, I think, which is a, there's quite a lot of stuff to do with perspective in the book. And so it, yeah. it felt to me that it um, uh, fitted and covered more bases maybe than, than the things that I've been thinking of before. I think title poems are quite difficult and my first book doesn't have a title poem either. That's a phrase out of out of one of the poems. I think there's a lot of pressure yeah. put on is title it, poems. Is you, it you know. your favourite child? To yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you were putting the book together, I think I asked you, well, do you, should you have a question mark mm. at the end of it or not? Yeah, I didn't like the idea of a, I mean, it's, it is a 
yeah, it's a question without a question mark, which I suppose is a bit peculiar, but um, struck me as be something slightly naff about having a question mark in the title, and so I sort of left it all to be artsy rather than naff. You know? well, but I'm too, I'm too confused slightly <laughs> as well. I mean, I think that maybe they're both titles that um, uh, invite consideration and also propose confusion. I don't know. Well, let's agree on one thing. The contents are certainly not naff. We would <laughs> not be here talking about them. Uh, that's for sure. Now, both books also, uh, you've had frustrations because of COVID, both of you, with these books. Uh, I think, Miriam, you were all set to be doing readings and all sorts after the publication. And hey, presto, COVID arrives. Yeah, I mean, I had, I had done um, some events with the book. Um, I was due to be here last year um which obviously then didn't happen but I, I think it's been it's been more of an issue for peter because his book came out a bit later than mine so right on the fringe of lockdown so it hasn't even been launched this is the thing and so it came out in march of 2020 and there might have been a week that it was possible to, to have a launch before everything locked down and then there's the question okay don't know how long lockdown is going to last week and maybe push it off and hope to get everybody together in person to, to launch the book and do we actually need a book of existentially glum poems at this precise moment <laughs> don't always switch off now. always it's not just existentially <laughs> glum <laughs> um, but but it's also okay with everything that's going on it, it would be a bit hubris to say come and watch me now yeah and then a couple of months down you're like well should i do it now or should i delay and it was great to have the invitation to come to Aleppo, and it's just a, such a shame that this year we can't do it with an audience as well. Mm. So I suppose in a way we're substituting for a launch with uh, today's talk. That's a lovely way of looking at it. Mm. Yes. Good, indeed. Well, you're both going to, to read and we'll see as we go along that um, there are common themes, common interests that appear between your selections. Um, so, um, I don't know who was going to, to read first. Um, I think I was going to read a few first and then Peter. Um, so, there's quite a lot of stuff um, situated in childhood in uh, both of our books. Um, but So, I'm going to read a couple of poems that are kind of set uh, in the house or on the road <laughs> that I grew up on. Um, and then one about a cat. To finish off this because you need a poem about a cat in every <laughs> in every reading um so this is the first poem in the book it's called the landing window is unspeakable which is a, a much more audacious title than i'm uh, accustomed to writing normally my poems have really boring titles like boot or something you know? <laughs> anyway the landing window is unspeakable there's a turn in the stairs beyond which, in the darkness, you are terrified to go. The realm of the creaking life, which somehow carries on when everyone is out cold and unable to witness it. There's a mind-made barrier at the door of your parents' room. Their sleeping frightens you, the heavy breath, the still recumbent forms. You've been ferried back from light-drenched places, in coaches, the customary glare of the mint-green bathroom trebled in intensity, like it sucked in pigment while you were gone. Then woken foxed by the dimensions of the house you've lived your whole conscious life in, the recurrent dream of a cat walking a wall, a provisional touching your father's hair. Um, so I grew up um, in the suburbs of Belfast, um, so there quite often wasn't a great deal to do. We were sort of marooned between uh, between something and something, and <laughs> uh, with nothing much around us ourselves. So I quite often had to make my own kind of amusement as a child. Um, this poem is is about uh, one such endeavour, which I I won't say anything about it before reading it because we'll maybe talk about it afterwards. Mm. It's called Sometimes Nothing, which is um, a sort of play on something that Elizabeth Bishop, who's one of my favourite poets, said, which was, sometimes everything feels like poetry, sometimes nothing does. Sometimes nothing. She never did it, the girl you were supposed to meet in pink slippers and dressing gown, in what seemed the dead of night after the world had gone to bed. 
Sodium lights still garnished the suburban street with the gladsome hue of territory. You waited on the curve of the road. There was nothing in particular to see. In what claimed to be the dead of night, you stood alone at the mouth of her development. Sodium lights still salad dressed the street. What were you waiting for? You'd always known she wouldn't do it. You leaned flimsily against the curve of the road, where the remnants of a wood you'd never had the name for scythed on its cluttered stream through the new development. And no bough juddered in the capricious night. You stood gilded by the sodium light as fat forms riffled through your parents' garden. You fought to keep yourself concealed from the nothing that was there. You wanted to go midnight walking. Where were you going to walk to? Through the developments, the pepper sniff of wood. You scuffing down the road in your slippers and your wee fleece dressing gown. You went home again, you climbed the creakless stair. You dreamt the dreams that were appropriate. Um, we are a house of cats as well as of poems. Um, I've uh, we've both had cats all of our lives. Um, so there has to be a cat poem. So this is um, a very short poem about the first time I, the time I brought my first cat home in car called Kitten, which is more usual for my title. <laughs> Kitten poem, Kitten. Bring him, bringing him home in the car, a handcuff's white spatter of fur in a carry box, the scale of the cavernous blue to Jonah. You thought him dead of a heart attack and halted to check. In what you remember as the dark, but can't have been given it was summer, round eyes met your hazel stare. The throat withheld its music, wary as muscles, the lungs creaked on their fragile string your face against the grid, blunt as a shark. <laughs> Please, at home, imagine yourselves with us here in Aleppo and give, give them a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Peter. Quite a few of the poems in this book, I think, um, have ended up being about distance um, in time or in space. And especially, I think I read a statistic that 78% of people, and I'm making this up, um, live within 11 miles of where they were born or grew up. And I'm, we're not mm. in that category. I don't think any of us are. And so much of my adult life has been about the phone calls home or about the attempt to try and keep family connections or a sense of community um, at a distance. And I think this is particularly common for, in my way of thinking about, about a Gaelic speaking community, because we have to do this at a distance now. In some ways in the last year it's become telescoping a lot easier because we have technology that allows us to do video calls, which is a lot more frequent than the letter home at New Year, say, from North America. But it's just an updating of that. Um, so this poem, Common, is about um, community at a distance. Hem of aan er fall of an hips. Is a fee make a phone her ash or vobile. Han jabon ye, your fiochlio shagus. Get a vai gish go by vail from a yacht tris na lunch and chiovaki. Inish can you eat your torch fierce and bego. Scavorn a hiroki cafe in the caninac. A cat in the snap and door of a torx vava. The breck of two warm and thrive can try. A seen a tossed shuck hum is haw. The torture in his law and a long rich, ra tree, had fallen through shall, is moving and fall. My mother is gone in a hips and has to call back on her mobile. The chapeur cut all across Lewis, and though she'd been in the middle of the common yachtry's funeral lunches, now I barely have her attention and can almost see her at the window ledge, watching unpickable threads of dark pattern the village's long black drip to the sea, silent except for hums and haws, as torches and paraven lamps flit twos and threes across Palantrusha and Mulgunthal. In my first book, 
when I wrote about place or when I wrote about myself, I tended, I think, to make them fabulous, as in turn them into fables, to, to try and avoid any kind of verisimilitude. Um, and I was unsure about that habit when I came to writing this one, I think. I think I was trying to go for something that had a bit more rootedness. So I mentioned Bound Through Shall Milk and Hall there, so very specific parts of the the Shatteropolis I grew up in <laughs> in the west coast of, of Lewis, um, where you have three or four villages run together to, to lead to 250 houses in total. And part of the process of being able to write that kind of poem, I think, is the, the poem that is the last one in this book, um, if you've got this far, which is one of my most odd autobiographical ones, I think, which is trying to, I would say, run a, a line through my life and things that I can remember from my childhood and how you use these things to try and create an identity or to create a history. And one of the elements in it is the Klondikers that used to be off the um, coast of Ullapool, because Ullapool has this weird place, and it's great to be here, but it's got a weird place in my childhood as somebody who grew up in Lewis, as a transit zone that you want to get out of as quickly as possible, or you don't want to <laughs> be held in for too long because that means the ferry hasn't gone. And so there's a weird in-betweenness about Ullapool for me, which I think is still in my walking around the streets here. I feel slightly out of place, and I quite like it. Mahurin Khafata Shaw. Mahurin Khafata Shaw skin to conduct Easter bike, Kisrad and Monia Hall. Shakat from Loch Sahranog to the Mulunum Gay. Is Tarshan the Monjik from being a clon like a scabra, a rack or far a hoster. From the Kruret Fagal. Let the Vala Drom van Irvain Droike. Package Space Raiders. British Corduroy. Catalog Freemans as Great Universal. Fact and Malach Rushinoch is Kermel Choch, and in Jorgen's Fen Hassel. Austrahage can optic heal can train gen, Hecknolus computer satchel, Frischich Kaskanaster, and his double think, Hurlorok and Thradshaw, Thradsh Valavan Skutel, Erheiset from in Doris Spear and Bike Agal, a hail at Otthol and in Tavanar, on the Haar, and in Yachtri Kotrola Haar. A hurin of at the shaw skin you can do a ricketur, cool with the han and a volunteer or serash, a keith core of vacrich macunusch. Gurut and colloquy kinds the vanner. Who's going to know you all a cotoike? A sa apathy atchikan and tash and sheer heery. Not the worst of all hain, then the herd again is a view to geary. Put the crack in the rock of Voskinen. Kindness kint the shampecky and like a tain your axon, and I in tolish. I shall all the serving with Kehu Mach, my German Vor Murut Buck. I have a real coffata shop, how young's of Vijelik, revanche and fusco Jemayaran. Can we soul of Hutton Cor? Lick Shakat Naha Kursh and Hare, I have a real coffata shop, Shin Fatapu Yor. If you've got this far, you must have borrowed a bike to make it past the loch and its cranog on the peat road through the turbines over the moor to the bay where Klondikers lie anchored offshore, your backpack full of childhood icons. A pack of space invaders, corduroys, a rusted three-iron, Freeman's catalogue and Great Universal, the Russian and German swears of Sven Hassel. And through optic fibres, high-speed train links, computer and satellite technology speeding and doublethink, found this trash-filled street. On the curb outside the door, you'll have left the bike one wheel spinning in dead air, in the unrelenting horror, in the cultural history of that horror. If you've got this far, you must have utterly changed who you are, switched languages and switched back at the first sign of threat or attack into something that will pass for a mother tongue, something you think you remember from when you were young. But now, in the night damp of this forever evening air, you realise you've let fewer people than you'd care to admit possess you. Ripples welt up under your skin, from the memory of your and their sins against the undimmable light. But all of this you can dismiss as the creating of unnecessary fuss. For if you've got this far, you've learned to treat open wounds as scars. Learn not to hope for the sea. Ignore the smooth, ignore the rough. If you've got this far, that's far enough. 
I've never tried to read another poem after reading that, um, just because it seems to end at this point where that's enough, I'm going to walk <laughs> off now, I'm going to <laughs> drop the mic. Um, but I'm going to read a very, very short one now, just because um, there are two or three allergies in the book as well, or two or three poems that are in memoriam, because that's a different type of distance. And it's a, how you keep that connection to people who are no longer there. And for me, one of the ways is through music, through remembrance of song or song lines or tunes. Um, and so there's an elegy for Kieran Carson in there who would always come to you and say, do you know this tune and whistle in your ear that this tune would, and his knowledge of music was far, far better than mine, so I never did. But I've still got this memory of these. But this is a poem for Sandy Hutchison who was very, very generous to both of us mm. um, when we came back to Scotland, or I came back to Scotland from Ireland and then came to live in Glasgow too. In memory, Sandy Hutchison. Ha shakat o mian aig on an olamuts, as a shin in mar kaapraj edr panorka agus hotel go. Sgit na chrogu ac am riaf ha thorst orom raglan road, go agus an dhaan nota hakam. Ach farm bachor gavi on Grafton Street in November. Ha usa gol harish le on a quiet street. As she na shine cover, na rana na skarig an shesh roboch, tripped lightly along the ledge, away from me so hurriedly. Guskaborg was in shine the jagara. Ach Sandy, her mochuras arinam, tok reach a hay now on twos. It's gone midnight in Olamuts, and we're staggering back from Panorca to Hotel Goal, and you have never had a voice. You'll get me to sing Raglan Road with the two notes I can muster. But where it should have been on Grafton Street in November, you take over with on a quiet street, and we sing on, the lines diverging in a ragbag chorus, tripped lightly along the ledge, away from me so hurriedly, until we're barely singing for the laughter. Ach, Sandy, you've got me all out of order. Take it again yourself from the top. Peter, I think I'd be very deeply appreciated in Liverpool where there are very warm, very fond memories mm -hmm. of Sandy Hutchison, I believe. Um, and you've every excuse for not attempting to sing Rag and Rhodes. It really is only one voice, one singer, who that song nowadays belongs to, uh, or did belong to, uh, I should say. Sandy you loved know? to sing it, but Sandy... <laughs> had rather better tunes in his head than Peter had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's lots of uprootedness and displacement um, coming up there in, in, in both poems, um, uh, both sets of poems. Um, just to pick up on um, if you've got this far, you describe that as autobiographical, and I think it is a very deeply autobiographical poem there. And, and you're talking about the transformation from uh, your bicycle taking you from childhood in Lewis to the, the, this wonderful phrase, the historical heritage of Har uh, in Edinburgh, which doesn't cast Edinburgh in a very good light, um, I take it by that. But there's the switch between languages and back and, uh, and so much going on in that poem. There's a lot stated in that poem. There's a lot stated there. The, um... We have a friend, Ben Morris, who from the United States, who came to Edinburgh to do a cultural history of horror. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it's almost the, the sense that everything in the world or everything in the adult world that I am now part of is turned into culture, culture industry, mm -hmm. or is there to be analysed or discussed. And I think there's almost a part of me that yearns or hearts for the existence and with meteorological ph phenomena without having to analyse, to discuss, to, to place it within these types of um, philosophical frameworks. And so I think there's part of me that, <laughs> that wants a pre-linguistic response to, to the world. But the other part of it for me is that my memory's terrible. And so it's quite hard to remember parts of my childhood and get it right. And so in the English and the Gaelic versions, there's a mistake in the English because the packets of crisps that you eat were not space invaders, they were space raiders. And at first remembered oh, them as space yeah. invaders and a second later draft of the Gaelic, I'd corrected it. But because of the so syllable count, I had to keep it as space invaders in the, the English. And so I'm 
happy enough that there's this divergence between the two, but there's also a, a doubt about, well, how much do I trust my own creation of myself? Well, that's a nice accent, or is it a Freudian slip or something? That, uh, that question of how much you can trust childhood memory, that question is posed frequently by both of you in, in the poetry. Yeah, I mean, it's perhaps... Um... They're all in second person, those poems as well. Like the, the two that, in fact, every poem that I read there was in second person. There is a lot of stuff in second person in my book. But it strikes me that yours is a different, it interested me when just when you were reading it, it's a different kind of second person because it's a quite authoritative, like it's almost like in mine, the you is the I, it's, it's a transposition of the I, and that is a distancing mechanism, a sort of separating, for me anyway, a, a separating off of. Um, and are looking at the self from the outside, but that yours feels, the distance feels greater in yours because it's almost uncertain who the you is there or if that's somebody else being invited into the terrain of your childhood memory or, or if who you're talking, who your you is, is less distinct, I think. Than I don't know. I, I think that's absolutely right. I don't know who the you is. And as happens with, with poems quite often, there's a lot more in there than I thought there was, mm. or that I knew that mm. there was. And so for me, I've got the reference to Sven Hassel. I'm a writer of Second World War books, who I read with my brother. We got them from Stornoway Library and we'd read them and create. Knew nothing about the man, and then you go away and discover that he was probably a Danish member of the German army in the Second World War, whose identity was unclear, or who, or who lied repeatedly about his identity. And so all of a sudden, even this one detail that I thought, okay, this is a concrete detail, I know who the you is, I know what the subject is, dissolves underneath your tongue. Mm. Yeah. And many of going back to um, the very first poem you read, mm. uh, the, the arresting idea of the landing window being unspeakable, <laughs> of the childhood terror on the landing. Um, what strikes me in that is that most people, as soon as they hear somebody grew up in Belfast, they will think, a place where nothing happened? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's such a contradiction to what, pe what people's image of Belfast um, was. Um, how could it possibly be a place where nothing was happening? Yeah, that was true. And the opposite was true. Of course, you also have that poem, that loaded word, provisional. Mm. which anybody from Northern Ireland will instantly recognise the significance of. Um, some, um, maybe we just hear, might just need a little prompt uh, to realise the significance. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I um, so the Sometimes Nothing poem, I mean, yeah, I've, I've actually got an essay about this. I wrote an essay, sort of, I've been writing more personal essays since this book mm. than, um, than poems. Um, poems are eluding me a wee bit <laughs> at the moment, but um, yeah, I wrote a long thing kind of thinking about the suburbs and the, and the particular area that, that I grew up in. But I mean, I think it is one of those things, you know, that yes, there was lots of stuff going on in, in Belfast, but you know, this is set, these two poems are set when I was about eight or something like that, you know, and it, we, it's not as though, I don't know, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it wasn't in everyday no. life in the burbs. In, I mean, it's a, it's a condition of life, you know, and it's, it's, it's a kind of background condition. So there are, um, there are ways of thinking or ways of going about things that are just, you know, I got used as a child to there being a Jeep with guns pointing out the back of it, at the front, of, in front of us at the lights and these kinds of things that are just normal, you know, but, um, I mean, I suppose it feel it would feel it's it's always felt to me a little bit uh, like troubles poems aren't really a, mm. um, they're a difficult arena I think for for somebody of my age and there are generations of people who are older than me who who were you know who were working as writers through that um, and um, to then follow after that and try to. Um, but it's also great understand. to see that, you know, there's maybe a, a, a presumption amongst some folk that, you know, if you are from Northern Ireland, you must write about mm. the troubles. Yeah. But, I mean, it's really not, I mean, writers who are younger than mm. me now say it's not, I mean, again, it's not, not part of their lives, it's not, not part of their personal and family histories, and it 
but it's not the focus of, of their poetry, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, it does, it snakes in there. I mean, the, the, the first poem is just a kind of catalogue of things I was frightened of when I was a child in the, in the house. And it was you a know, typical think, you know, childhood thing. Yeah, so things like, you know, when we went away on a holiday, um, when we, we had one of those green bathroom, you know, like a sort of mint green one, yeah, rather than rather than the famed avocado suite, you know, but it we, we used to be a, a family joke that it glared at us, you know, whenever we came back or... Um, and and I did used to I did used to stand as a kid outside my parents' bedroom door like if I you were know, had a, if I had a nightmare I would stand outside the door of it and kind of un wanting to go in and, and be comforted but I'm sure about waking them and then later as an adult I'd sometimes wake up in the night and be paranoid in case they weren't breathing or something you know so it's a yeah just yeah, a yeah. compilation of childhood frighty things which I suppose I hope cumulatively work to sort of destabilise the space of the house and make it um, disorientating. I love that idea of, of the the mint green bathroom suite absorbing colour into it <laughs> when it wasn't being watched. Yeah. <laughs> Is it Nick Lear who's got the um, great poem about how boring the troubles were, how you would find a... Uh, yeah, it's the Scouts, it's called Scouts or something, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you about the wash, it, like walking along things with washing machines and which way there's one of those near us as well, we used to call it the washing machine walk where people dump their white goods. And were, <laughs> but you weren't allowed to touch them just in case mm -hmm. and so yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a sense of prohibition. Um, I think what, especially the, the poems about the Soviets, you created mixing banality with existential horror. <laughs> and the, 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 um, or the, the banal atmosphere or this uh, an undefined place but infusing it with a huge, with a fantastic atmosphere yeah I mean I think it, it's interesting when you were talking about your poems and, and sort of your um, what, what Shadaropolis <laughs> that you it's, because these things are uh, I did a reading um, just before this book came out in Belfast um, at a, a conference that was organised by some friends and um, the writer who was um, interviewing interviewing me for that sort of said to me that it, like you have these poems that are in set in Scotland and they're set in particular places in Edinburgh. The ones in Northern Ireland either aren't set anywhere or it's minging, <laughs> where or they're minging, which I haven't quite worked out in my mind the minging bit yet. But uh, um, uh, in terms of what why that is, but the ones I mean. I suppose these those two poems I read are set in, you know, they're set in my mum and dad's house or across the street from my mum and dad's house uh, on an evening where I would thought it would be exciting to break out of the house and go for a walk in my pyjamas with a girl who lived across the road. Um, uh, but it's not really, um, I can't imagine, I mean, first of all, I didn't know the names for, you know, um, because the names are stripped out of, <laughs> or new names, the names of developments are put in, but um, they're not kind of written with the intention of like other people recognising those particular places or... Uh, Which is an issue in, in Northern Ireland, you, that people want to identify spot, label, pin down, mm. uh, and you then lose the universality. Um, uh, you know, the, the childhood terror, the, the banal experience, um, or that lovely moment at the, at the end of that poem where uh, you know, you've been out in your your wee fleece, <laughs> <laughs> your wee fleece dressing gown. Of course, your friend hasn't turned up. No, after she was night. checking about it. She didn't come. She said she couldn't get out, but I never believed her. Right? But there's no <laughs> creak from the stair. You're completely unnoticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one noticed me go out. Nobody noticed me come back yeah. back in. Father was horrified the first time he heard that <laughs> book because they never knew about it. But yeah. I think you're right. I mean, one of the things with that I find working with wanting to work with memory because these are things that you know um it's happened maybe it's just an aging thing or maybe it's being away from um where i'm from or where i grew up but um memory is kind of a sail me in like video format almost mm -hmm. you know they kind of zip in and zip out and um there is an urge on my part when you know with some of those things some of them aren't interesting at all and i don't I have no idea why i've remembered them but um with other things, it's a kind of desire in me to record and keep and save those things for myself. But then that's terribly interesting 
you know, just, I remember this, this happened, it isn't particularly interesting for anybody else. And so you're having to try and work with, or the urge on my part is to do something with that, uh, whether it be exploring how, how memory works or, or atmosphere or whatever that, that is actually going to um, compel and cross uh, the um, phone, go through the phone line to somebody else, you know. Yeah, which takes about that familiar experience of, I'm sure all of us have, of talking to your mother on the phone and being told who are the latest people to have died um, in the community. You're clearly very conscious of community but being displaced from it uh, and that community linguistically vanishing being being dissipated even in its um, own rooted territory now i might use this as a way of going into the second part of the readings because the the first poem i was going to read more or less speaks to this um if that, if that works the it's difficult writing out not to talk about culture or language death because this is something that from a very young age you are told if you grow up in the Gaelic speaking area you are a minority language, it is dying, it is dead and this has been the story for 300 years, 400 mm -hmm. years, 2000 years if you listen to this book, he relates it back to the dying box. Each generation thinks it's saying it for the yeah. first time. Mm -hmm. And also each generation then thinks you have the responsibility to preserve to maintain. And I'm ambivalent about that preservation. Um, I think it's a fantastic thing. And so when you were talking about the, the lack of place names in the suburbs mm -hmm. there, there's a great book just out from Mapa which traces in minute detail the names of every little lull stream river mm -hmm. in the north of Lewis. And so I have all of this data, all of this information that I can draw on or not. It's almost unavoidable though, because it is preserved which leaves you very little imaginative room in mm -hmm. some ways. Mm -hmm. And there's a risk of feeling that you are in a museum rather than a living culture and that we end up living in a museum aspect version of our own culture. And this fills me with a sense of dread in itself, whether the, this idea of being stuck in one particular way of interpreting the world rather than something that is fluid and changing. Which brings me to the Dead Zoo, which is the, the name of um, the name given to the National History Museum in Dublin. Um, and it's this sense of what was once alive but being preserved in slightly nightmarish ways. Um, Sumarav. Nurvohistu, Gavalur Koi, Blee on the Call, the Chin, Gukriach, Hage of Hanasu, and Chesme and Balakriya. A yek in a pelican yo horop the hoo. In time that amor, tav of the chrieuf, in a rangatang crochet the buccanoo on spirish, as in giraffe, rat the streak. When yo, yak change of consume marav, wan fuel the heap rock, cot and pasky, soon and glanius crew on his ire, a scavan is crea and unbroken the formal died, crater in the crow on reef. Snach Jachabi Spader Jackalope Griffin Lan Ranavich Hydra the Crack and Machrich Elsness Almirage. We are Mac Yanamatach Hinaloch, a sheer crook of Trahur Pishak the Plock and the Wife, Scott Sklet of the Connemoch. And so who knew Fan Net Marav, Hanach Nav Shaw and Carriage Baba for Beal of Brew. A change can the grave when your can do that. Dead zoo. When your lover is finally bored of you and your five years are coming to a head, then you should go to Dublin Zoo to see the orangutan hang half hearted off its ledge, the amor tiger indolent in its cage, pelicans squabbling on unfertilized eggs. Or perhaps to the dead zoo, the relics of the age of empire. Cotton wrap, formaldehyde, glass eyes, liver, heart, lungs, and rarefied pottage. What even better, a travelling show of beasts that never died. The squader, almirage, jackalope, griffin, scale and fur held upright by aluminum insides. A bricolage of weasels and snakeskins, rabbits in a schoolroom, 
kittens playing croquet, the rogue hybrids of our imagination. For you too are a zoo that's half dead, that decays. See the couple stood dumb in front of the canoe. Nothing is preserved here. There's nothing to say. That's probably one of the most depressing points in the book. Sorry, I'm not the show. Like, apart from the one about syphilis, which was. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you say depressing, it also has that black humour in it. I, I, I think one. We can get too hung up about the responsibility of being the last generation to speak Gaelic. And I think there's this weird way that comes with it. I think if you are going to have serious play with the culture and with the traditions and the heritage, then you're missing an opportunity. I think there should be black humour about almost everything. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point that you make there. I mean, at one point, television advertising in Ireland was, was you putting out ads with captions such as "Na be Dukish, let's not be the last generation of native speakers. Um, very self-consciously. Um, yeah, that links in very nicely to Dead Zoo. Um and, and I think the it is it's a serious thing. Every but language is a tool, language is a medium, language is a way of celebrating and expressing yourselves. And as long as you're able to keep changing that, as long as you're, it's able to evolve, then it will survive. And I, I don't think we're the last generation of Gaelic speakers. I think it will be going on for a while yet enough. Um, and the last poem I'm going to read is another family poem, because again, it's the idea of how do you try without allowing things to simply become um, still static memories. How do you try and remember somebody who's not there, but in ways that are true to them, but also, as Miriam was saying, allows it to speak to other people. It's not just memory for your own sake, memory for your own personal commemorative reasons. Dex charges. Which are Hermesites, uh, because he was diabetic, so Dex charges are what he put into his teeth. The grand of the chain is Chath and Hyardoch. Because her soul and cloth, they can smell on her skirt, they can snatch. As a push age and levy ted nyoni, a few nyoni, er ulus look on spawn. Send dark at this, he a fecking, crop and snatch, a true jerusalem. Herokalikeke. Fakalike york is on the catch with no con. Cousin skirvax and beer the shorter. Bring on knee and ek in that manner. If you could go on sapler and break and a shack on the feet of Aram Fagal Gaul, tear or village and radiator. Ho had depth charges a hain, found a hockey and an Africa, if you could torches and tenu, me yer howl and jay that granny cave in Escarlino, as he can cane her when the bleen can a shag of the hay, as the bleen can me yer a kicker since she nick at the shint the heacher. Fadrif had of crack leher of Orok. It's a hurricane ripse, your put in some roll and kuchum kirsch. Pondish cinnavan van kart of fur as watch the kind gay. Pondish cinnavan jeer kuchok. If you can empty Macassar to sleep of she's a cool aroma, as a gay should be kept down the genuine mart. The vent for Kyonski a microwave, as a Gian was earnish. If you can shine, my brother, so vest. A row of forty medals on his chest. Kahav all hain. A gule and a nailis and snatch were lend you a mathis and thigh. Snail and directionoch, a cherubic thigh directionoch. Grand had come in from the workshop to borrow her eyes, the thread having slipped from the needle and his patience had stared in nothing, passing nothing, having unwound from its spool. In the dark you'd see the eyes of needles pressed on the inside of the lids. He had no garlic. He had enough garlic for the dogs and cats to shoo them in, to feed them sneakily. He could see the young girl and her mother. He'd carry swatches of tartan into the men left perch, drinking an oversweet tea on the rusting heater. He took depth charges himself. He had served in the war in Africa. He would finally unreal when her grandmother died one linoleum afternoon and would remember it as the happiest time of his life in those final years, that long frame of the thread. 
He found it hard in the end to get suppliers she trusted for leather or bottles that had the right weight. The workshop was his space alone, cold and lit with a certainty of God. God was his too. The antimacassar would slip down the back of his cushion as he listened to countdown with the volume high. A widow out he learned to microwave and make do, he sang, my brother, Sylvest, a row of forty medals on his chest. Repeated himself. Would cradle the kilt and the thread and needle back out of the house, invisible thread confirming an invisible hole. <coughs> Holding that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for that. Um, I will talk in a little while about some of those. Mary? Yeah, okay, so um, I'm going to read two poems this time, uh, one of which is kind of um, a rogue hybrid <laughs> of my imagination, I guess, um, partly spurred into being uh, from listening to War and Peace on the radio over New Year <laughs> in the car um, in snatches and partly kind of driving from a memory of being stranded off the coast of Northern Ireland with my sister and my great aunt uh, when we were kids, because on a wee island that you could kind of walk out to, you know, when the tide was out, but uh, the great aunt misjudged it and the tide came back and we were still out there. And there was much consternation. Um, uh, uh, that said, none of us are actually in this. That's just, that's just where it started. Uh, it's, it's called The Oak That Was Not There. The oak that was not there was not there, and the sands went walking under the sea. The clocks went forward, the clocks went back. Someone lost their temper with me. From a hillock, we looked on as water swept its grey silk garment through the estuary. The clocks went forward, the clocks went back. The penitent, down on his knees, begged for the honey of forgiveness from around God whose presence we had proven. The clocks went forward, the clocks went back, there was no response. But we must act responsibly, said our grave leader as the flowers of the macker grew scissor faces. On their faces, the hands of the second went chop, chop, chop. The digitalis ate a mink. To think, one murmured that it should come down to this. Another nodded. I consent there is something wrong. As the blown glass nimbi angled and clinked, and the clocks went back and forwards, back and forwards. Where is the oak for one thing? Where is the blasted oak? And the round god fell from the sky like a fish. I've got absolutely no idea <laughs> I arrived at that from uh, from the start point, but there you go. Um, so Peter read a poem about his grandfather. Um, this is a poem about my grandmother, my uh, my mother's mother, uh, which is unlike Peter's sort of set at a point where I, you know, long before I knew her. Um, um, so I suppose like your grandfather seeing the mother, uh, the little girl and your mother, this is me. Um, mm. It is based on, I can talk about it a bit more afterwards, it's based on um, some knowledge of something, <laughs> you know, but uh, she was, a, she was a, a professional ballroom dancer and um, uh, a ballroom dancing teacher as well. And her name was Betty Staff um, and that's, the poem is called Betty Staffs, so um, named after her, the name of her establishment. In retrospect, it turns out that her bouncer was like an octopus, nimbling across the floor to take his fill from the bar, perched back sweetly at his post before a body would think to look. It's the 1950s, so she doesn't have cameras on the door or on the dance floor. He flashes his teeth, parades the tart liquor on his breath to the queue of nice specimens from the shankle who, in a breath, will shift their coloration like mimic octopuses, stepping out neatly and daintily in pairs across the floor, picking out from the clutch of men at the bar with expert eyes, the silver-haired foxes in their fifties who keep them in drink, and the young bucks with whom they'll take up post for the slower numbers. His back straight as a post, Betty's partner steers her through a tango while the punters catch their breath. She was a one child when she came here to work, 
But by the 1950s, Betty's living the life. She's like something out of Octopussy or some such yet to be invented model for glamour. And there seems no bar to her success. Though mastery of the dance floor isn't everything. And there is space on Betty Staff's floor like you wouldn't want. No matter the scores of bills she posts in the city's theatres and tea shops, the high-end hotel bars. Betty's a snob, they say under their breath. When you go out dancing, you want to go octopus. And there's no jiving at Betty's. And this is the 1950s. And where else can you not go jiving in the 1950s? Who does the stiff bitch think she is? Would it floor Betty if she knew this? Would it sour her puss to know that her dance hall is the hall of last resort for the post-pub heading for the swinging 60s crowds? Put to it, an octopus can hold its breath for 30 minutes out of water, can navigate a bar of land as expertly as Betty Staff holds herself at the bar. Things won't always be like they are in the 1950s, though Betty's already learned to hold her breath by the 50s. Not that you'd know to watch her move across the floor. Betty believes in appearances. She knows how to keep her post. At home, her husband flails like an octopus. More than once, he will knock her to the floor and free of breath. But to the jewel-clad notion of the post-war 1950s, Betty will play the mother octopus. Lengthen your neck. Die Nacht ist wunderbar in ever more deadly earnest. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I'm very glad you chose to read that one. Uh, it's uh, not on its own, but it's a finely, finely crafted poem, that one. And I think people maybe just hearing it for the first time, and, and quite apart from hearing the performance, will pick up on the structure of the mm. poem. It's, it's a, Sistine, it's all about rule of six. Do you want to kind of say something about that? Uh, sh sure. Um, so the form is yeah six line, six six line stanzas and a three line stanza known as the envoy. At the end, you have to use the same words at the ends of the lines in a fixed rotational pattern, um, and then they have to appear two to a line in the envoy as well at the end. So it's yeah, it's it's a kind of complicated dance <laughs> of a thing yeah. itself, you know, um, which uh, I mean. It's appropriate for ballroom dancing. Mm. And I think, I mean, I don't sort of, I didn't set out going, okay, well, I've got this idea and I'm going to write a Sestina. It sort of proposed itself that way. The first stanza kind of came out and was six lines long and had interesting words at the end of the lines. And I thought, hmm, do you want to be one of these? And then got the rules out because, of course, you can't remember, you know, what, what, what kind of way that they cycle around and kind of gave it a go. And um, it wouldn't have been, you know, it would have been, an entirely different poem and perhaps no poem at all if if, if I hadn't taken that formal proposition, I guess. Um, I, I don't think there are many Sistinas with octopus as one of the words. <laughs> <laughs> that was, well, I mean, um, that threw me, yeah, threw me a few spanners. <laughs> There's, I mean, there are a couple of moments of strain in the performance of the poem, I suppose, um, as in the... Uh, not the reading of it, but you know the making of it as a uh, the form of it as a kind of performance of its own. Um, but um, I sort of don't mind that those moments of strain are there because it's kind of it's a um, um, Freddie Mercury can say it better than me. It's okay, you know, the show must go on kind of thing. It, yeah. And it is a poem that's kind of about keeping the show going um, despite things. You know, or how you respond to the things that are thrown at you, or um... yeah, Betty Staff intrigues me. She sounds a very fascinating woman. Mm. Yeah, I mean, she um, she's gone out. She's gone quite a long time yeah. now. She died when I was eleven, but um, yeah, she um, she moved it. Yeah, she, I don't know how much you want me to kind of. <laughs> talk about her but she she moved to and um, she was from Shrewsbury originally she moved to Northern Ireland in uh, like when she was 17 like, to for a job you know working in somebody else's dance hall and then built up her own business and she um she was all, all Ireland champion a couple of times with her 
her dancing partner. Um, things weren't quite so seamless, you know, in the <laughs> in the background and yeah. the in the yeah. personal life. But um, as we hear towards the end of the mm, poem, yeah, yeah. I mean, the poem kind of came out of. Um, I'll shut up about it in a minute. But I uh, a couple of year, or a few years ago, I, I sort of took a notion to see if she if there was any stuff about her online. You know, if she left. Yeah. So when she died, there was a, a sort of full page obituary in the Belfast Telegraph over and so on. But um, that was pre pre internet, and I, I had to sort of snoop about on the internet to see if there was anything about her, and there wasn't really anything sort of like one photograph, um, which. Um, was kind of cut her in half because they were obviously interested in the other couple that were in it rather than her and her dancing partner. And this thing called the Belfast Forum where like a sort of discussion board thing where people had posted, um, somebody had posted a thread, does anybody remember Betty Staffs? And then a couple of people had responded to that um, in not entirely generous terms. Uh, so somebody put up a post going, ha, 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 yeah, I used to work as her bouncer, enjoyed nicking her drink when her back was turned. And somebody else had sort of put something up going, that's ah, crap, because you can jive in it and why, you know, you'd only go there if you couldn't get in anywhere else at the end of the night or something like that. People have borne that grudge since the 90s. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably, yeah. Uh, And I'd sort of, my back went up for her, you know, and, and that that's really where, um, um, it doesn't explain the octopus, <laughs> component, but that's where the, the spur for writing it came from, you know, a sort of defensiveness in the in the face yeah, of people yeah. criticizing her and, and kind of having a go, you know, um, or taking the arm out of her, or, you know. Hmm. Uh, Peter, there's a reference in your death charge poem, um, which I wanted to ask you about. Um, Fesco Lionel will have known him afternoon. Mm. That, to me, conjures up an afternoon sat in the kitchen by the Rayburn. Am I picturing the wrong thing? The not the not the Rayburn, probably um an old cooker that has a griddle put on top of it to make pancakes. Ah, oh, right. I would say. Um which is if I were to close my eyes and imagine my grandmother from Sky, that's where I'm with her with her penny on and the preparing the dogs and cat food just there and then always making pancakes. Um, and it was in her kitchen that she died as well. And so there was there, there's something about that precise memory and memory in place, which is a happy and tinge with sadness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there was, because the linoleum afternoon really stands out for me as well, and it evokes entirely different things for me, but that's because we had linoleum in the house as well, you know, but that's fine. I can take that and I can have that. And it, it gave me something that I could fill with my own imagination. You know, um, that, and I saw just yesterday online, I can't remember the name of the artist, who has an artwork which is their grandmother's line of floor up on the wall. And you can see where the, the food, divots, the divots yeah. and where, where things were placed, but also where it's been worn because of the food mm -hmm. spending all of the time there. And so it's this weird memorial of a life lived. Are or we back to the Dead Zoo with that? Go back to the dead zoo with that, but it, it's a way of trying to find traces as well. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, there is so much more we could go on and talk about uh, because these two collections have just a wonderful amount, wonderful amount of treasures in them for time to be spent over and, and um, thought about and reread and come to greater understanding of them. And I have to say also, I love the photograph on the cover <laughs> of what Pilot is um, cat and dog peering over a balcony in what looks like a dilapidated Italian street or something. I think it's in Paris. Uh, it's Paris, yeah, yeah. is it? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, just love the photograph on, on the front of that. Uh, please look out for it and acquire it for yourselves. Um, maybe just kind of uh, in closing, have we maybe demonstrated that these books are um, coalescing around a theme, each of them? It strikes me that, that um, the poem is the most nimble uh, literary form in that it's allowed out on its own. It doesn't have to be in a book, in a collection. <laughs> Great it, it can be in the head, <laughs> it can be in print singly, um, and a book can be a collection of work to date, it can be um, themes, a collection of themes, or it can even be something like a concept album um, where it all works towards the same end. I mean, how do you see these two books, both of you? If 
first of all, I love the idea of a poem being allowed out on its own. Like, <laughs> 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 like the so like, down the stairs, yeah, not making creeping out, face. creeping out in its wee fleece for yeah. a walk. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think for me, um, the way I've made books thus far has has always been I write what I write in a particular period of, you know, across a particular period of time. And then at some point comes the point where you wonder whether you have a book and then you kind of look uh, or I look through what I've got and try and work out if there's one there. Um, and then I try to make the book from the poems. So I think um, I think it would be very strange to have a book that didn't have recurrent themes and obsessions because mm -hmm. they're made by the same person at, yeah. <laughs> in a in a particular period of time but the thus far they haven't been started from me for me from that point this that you know the um the poems come first and then the book comes after um, do you want to Yes, I'm just trying to think, I'm trying, trying to not be too packed because I'm coming up with images and I'm not convinced by any of them. But the, the, I think in both of the books, there we've got an interest in repetition and I think how themes recur or change or transform. So in my book, I've got three poems called The Ideal Conditions for Reading This Poem. I've got two called Translated from the Original. Mm -hmm. And so there's this idea of something horrific about repetition, um, but also something reassuring. And so the question of the recurring themes is always going to be there, but they might point in really quite different directions as the book goes on. The nimble poem. Um, when you when you read Betty Staffs, I always think about the octopus that was found to be able to sneak out of its tank. Yeah, it's in yeah, it. Yes. And go yeah. That one. Yeah. And isn't it in it? Oh, no, it isn't. It it just but nimble. I was thinking of it nimbling across yeah, you know? the floor. Uh, <laughs> and I think poems are quite like that octopus. You look at it one day and it's just in its tank, fine. <laughs> and then you watch the CCTV footage afterwards and it's nipped out and gone and done something entirely different. <laughs> That's a brilliant really image of what a poem is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, a book like this might be like a stretch of water, a stretch of ocean that looks quite uniform. And then underneath, you've no idea what's going God, on. God, you are going for it with the images, oh, aren't you? <laughs> it's partly because when I was reading, I realised I've got three poems with submarines in them. I have no idea why. They're, they're just dotted around the collection. There's a submarine on the back cover, I think, as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah that, ha I mean, yeah. I've always got a concern when I put books together is how many horse poems are there and how many cat poems are there and are they together, you know. <laughs> but also, um, at, at some point, somebody pointed out to me that the pigs keep appearing in my first book, which I was just, I mean, I knew there was a poem with a pig in it, but who knows, you know. They, they cropped up. They nimbled in. <laughs> so. Well, nimble poetry from both of you, I have to say. Uh, there clearly going to be more awards to come, Marion. Um, and um, I think it's good that this one has been recognised with Ireland's most um, generous poetry prize, as I said. Um, hopefully there's going to be another collection with more awards. And uh, Peter, I have to say, I, uh, I look at you as one of the two most interesting and adventurous Gaelic poets writing today. I'm not going to say who the other one is. <laughs> That would be uh, entirely wrong uh, to mention any other names, but it's been a great pleasure to be able to speak to you today. I wish we could uh, carry on and do more, as of course, if we were all together in the Cayley Place or uh, in the Village Hall in Alapool, we would be doing. Uh, so please do look forward to next year. But meanwhile, um, can you virtually applaud and thank everybody who's been involved in running this virtual festival this year? Uh, everybody who's planning for things to be back together on site in Olympool next year and in particular can you thank and make sure you look for the books by Miriam Gamble and Peter Mackay. Tapalai, thank you. Thank you so much. Tapalai for Mark and his journals. Yes, <laughs> On the edge of the west, beneath the wilds of the Banichs, the Jiri, Bengola, Alipu, Kuridin Sanctuary. Where the skies rise further, where the heather scores the west, Summer Isles, Hebrides. These houses painted white, a metropolis whose streets you can count on your fingers, and the pier 
its tongue stuck out, licking salt from the air. Here are friendly, welcoming people. Their supper is a very black and white, flapping flag, silver sparkle, coconut room. Here, it's the scale of what blows through you as the wind burls the islands, sieving winter's thoughts from our heads. And all along Market Street, the bloom of cherry blossom, making the Japan of olive wood. 